Yes, ma'am. Your uh, screen is visible. Okay. Okay, so I will start. It's 12.03. <clears throat> so, uh, we'll talk about programming models. Um, I think people are still joining, right? So, at, just two comments about uh, the previous talk. There was a question of security, and uh, I said that on the same note, right? <clears throat> uh, there is some chance. But of course, uh, what I did mean is uh, that is subject to that you have exploited some vulnerability, right? Uh, I hope that was clear. And this, <coughs> uh, um, yeah, okay. So we'll start with this. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, sure. I have a question that uh, most of the laptops we use nowadays, they are a multi uh, multi core system, so they are uh, uh, that uh, and they are NUMA systems. So you can check that mostly uh, they may not. They may not be NUMA. All systems may not be NUMA, but um, most of the high end systems, if you uh, look at any lab system <clears throat> they they may be a numa system uh, so there's a command called numa ctl which gives you an overview of the numa nodes so if it's just one node it'll just show you one node if it's two node it'll show you two <clears throat> two numa nodes and what are the cores in each of the nodes okay okay <clears throat> so yeah i did not mean that all laptops are numa <clears throat> today but uh, we are talking of uh, slightly higher end systems here, right? Um, so in that context. Uh, another thing, uh, make uh, that uh, make command, it is a uh, new mother. Which make command? I uh, make command we use in, uh, uh, in command line systems to build things. And stuff. Okay, so, okay, so what does that do? That, that is just a compilation. Right? That just compiles your code. No, no. Uh, the make command has a, a feature uh, where we can mention the number of cores we are using us uh, and things like that. So yeah, my, if you do minus J2, it means your <coughs> compilation itself. It's a compiler is a code, right? Compile the software. So that itself will run on two cores. That has nothing. That is not NUMA aware as far as I know. Um, so make command is NUMA aware is not probably the right thing to ask. What you uh, may, so make, uh, so what does make do? It does compilation. Compiler, is the compiler NUMA aware? <clears throat> if you make the compiler NUMA aware, then yes. Uh, but yeah, most compilers may not be. Oh, okay. In fact, uh, so have you used any application that uh, where you actually got speed up with the uh, parallel make? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. okay. So generally the scientific application, there are many scientific applications that actually take probably 15, 20 minutes to compare, uh, compile because the code is so large. So often we use parallel make. And there you get significant speed up, but um, sequential small codes may not be that much, right? Anyways, so we'll start with the um, programming, right? So, um, as you already know, right? So we are talking of two 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 kind of uh, programming models here. One is shared memory. So the assumption is that okay, you have uh, the entire address space which is visible to all the processes in, or threads on the system, and then the other is message passing. So you may even use message passing on a single system. So you have different processes and you're using message passing. That is, you have a queue. Uh, so this this is this you have read in OS, right? So you have a queue and you basically put some messages into the queue and OS takes care of how you do the IPC, right? 
so very similar context will we will zoom to the um, to our world of multiple nodes in a few slides so um, a very popular uh, programming paradigm that is used for shared memory programming is openmp underlying it is p threads if you have done p threads in os course so uh, you know that there is certain amount of complexity in p threads in vault right so it hides openmp kind of hides that so here the assumption is that you so open mpp threads these are so you basically run multiple threads and if you have four cores and you launch four threads so typically four threads will run on those four cores the os will schedule but if you even if you have two cores and you launch four threads os will of course schedule four threads on two cores you may get a little bit of performance hit or may not <clears throat> the other programming paradigm that is very widely used is MPI. So there was a question, what is uh, what language is used, right? So language is one thing, but you also need to uh, remember the last slide that I showed, communicate and cooperate among all the processes. So how does that happen? Basically, you use another uh, kind of abstraction, you can say, um, runtime library, which is called MPI. So you don't have to do any um, you don't have to TCP, open TCP socket and do the you know client server programming or anything like that. So MPI takes care of all the communications. And here we will talk about processes. So for OpenMP, it's threads, and for MPI, it's processes. OpenMP, you can run only on one node. You cannot go beyond one node. Of course, um, you can run <coughs> uh, MPI plus OpenMP which is MPI runs on uh, two different nodes and internally you can have um, within a node you can have one MPI process, two MPI processes, within a process you can have open MP threads and so on. So that's possible, right? Okay, so the primary dis uh, uh, distinguishing factor is shared address space, distinct address space. We are talking of two different processes, so you cannot, you don't have the same address space. In OpenMP, it's sort of implicit communication, right? You, if a thread modifies a shared variable, the other thread will be able to look that up. And in MPI, you need to explicitly say that, oh, I want to send this variable because the other process is not going to look into my memory uh, space. And so I have to send this variable to explicitly send that variable to the process if the application demands so. Okay, so a few slides about OpenMP first, and then we'll go to MPI. So, this is a very a well uh, adapted standard for shared memory programming. It consists of uh, some compiler directives. Mostly it is directive based programming. So you write some compiler directive and the compiler internally does a lot of things magic for you, right? So there are, so these kinds of uh, open standards, they, they're generally consortiums or you know, review boards. So OpenMP has OpenMP architecture review board and it has been around for about 20 years. The, <clears throat> Currently, it was uh, its version 5.1 with many additional features added every version. And uh, so, underlying what you have, you have of course your CPU cores, then you have the OS, and then you have the OpenMP library. So, like I said, OpenMP is based on P thread. So, what so you may already know what is P thread. So, it's basically a thread based, you know, uh, fork join model. So, you spawn a number of threads. And so, which is forking, and then you compute in parallel, and then join. Right? It's in P threads. If you if you know, uh, you need to create a thread and so on. In OpenMP, you just write this one line as a compiler directive, and that's it. It forks a number of threads uh, within this block. The number of threads, whatever your computation you want to do in parallel, you can do. Right? So let's look at that in detail but before that we should actually um, review a little bit of os so so can someone say what is a process i know what you're going to tell me it's a instance of pro program execution and i have that on the slide so but what more what what is a process how can you define a process more than that yes A uh, process is an instance which runs, uh, which may run multiple threads or a single thread at a time. 
Okay, and what else? Let's say we have single thread process. So how do you, so what, what exactly consists of the process? I mean, what do you mean by, you know, the instance? What, what is that? Where is that? So oh, it's, it's generally an uh, application, you can say, a single application, uh, which has uh, okay. a, which has its uh, own. Uh, instance of an application, you can call it as a process, right? Process, the term process, what else does it mean? As in, what else does it consist of? Uh, it has its own uh, heap memory. Right. Okay, so it's not only heap, there's a number of things that a process has, right? Runtime, runtime. It has, yeah, so it has stack, yeah, it has stack, it has text, data, there's also BSS, which is missing here, and there's heap, right? I think you probably know most of these. Uh, so code, the code that you write, it basically goes to the, um, you know, texts, a segment and then you have data which is like initialized data if you have in your program uninitialized data goes to bss and heap is like if you do malloc and so on and stack is for you know function and so on now what is the difference between process and thread if i had to if i ask you using this diagram can you distinguish between a process and thread what what would you say what's the difference between a process and a thread. Process will have everything uh, its own stack, text, data, and heap. But mm -hmm. thread can uh, uh, can share data, and uh, though it will have uh, can have text also, it can share. But it it can have its own heap and stack for threads. Or it will have different. Anyone threads. else? Okay. Anyone else? Uh, a process can have multiple threads. So a thread is a subset of a process, we can say in a, in a way. So what does it mean? A pro so process has multiple threads, that is fine. I'm just asking what is the distinguishing uh, factor between a thread and a process from the point of view of this, you know, address space. So we have, we have already said that a thread or a process, okay, it consists of stack, text, data, heap, okay. Now, if you say multiple threads of a process, so how is that represented in memory? They are using the same uh, memory space, the different threads. The entire memory space? No, the same, um, they're sharing the same memory space as the process. The so memory space, like you can see, I have four different parts here, or five, whatever. So are they sharing threads have all this? Stack. Huh, pardon? Pardon, uh, and uh, each thread have their own stack. Right. So <clears throat> threads, every thread has its own stack, which is where it will store its local variables and so on. So uh, um, remember, we can, you know, if, if you have a program, you can spawn n number of threads. You can uh, spawn and you can also, you know, you can do a fork and join. It comes back to single thread and so on, and you can spawn multiple numbers, different numbers of threads at different points of the application. So whenever you're instantiating a thread, it means you have this different stack um, for each thread, okay? Um, <clears throat> okay, so with that, let's go into actual programming, right? So the first thing is, so I said that uh, you have a number of compiler directives, right? So this is the compiler directive. It starts with hash pragma OMP. And another important thing is you need this header file, omp.h, okay, to use this uh, hash pragma omp. And then you have uh, what they call as a construct, which is uh, parallel here is a construct. And then you have num threads four, which is a clause, which says that I want to spawn four threads, right? The next part, I'm sorry, this, uh, this should be actually, not this arrow. Um, so this is the structured block. I'm sorry, so not not till this point. So this part is the structured block. What they call a structured block. This is where your number of threads here, as we said, four. So there are four threads. Okay. And uh, so here, uh, one thing uh, to notice. So we have used what compiler directive. We have also used a a function call, which is open if we uh, library call. 
And so for that you need of course the other header file and when you compile this code you need to pass a flag which is minus f open mp in case of gcc yeah uh, otherwise everything is almost the same right uh, okay so this is a simple code and uh, this is how you run so this you you should be able to run without if you have gcc you should be able to run this code and during the lab exercise uh, please try out these codes we will upload uh, we have uploaded and we'll uh, share those codes with you. So firstly, please try out all the codes that I'm describing here. OK, so what do we have here? We just have hello world and uh, we are printing number of threads. So how many print statements are we going to see when we run this code? Uh, four. Yes, there are four. Execution context, right? Four threads are going to execute these two statements int num threads and printf. So there will be four printfs. And every of those four threads, they are going to print hello world four, hello world four, and so on. Okay. Okay. So one, um, one thing if you observe in this code is you have the you have statically specified this four here, right? If you want to dynamically specify, so if you don't want to statically specify, right? And um, if you just call this, right? And you have not specified anything, it'll, it has some default number of threads that will launch. If you specifically want to say that I want to launch a certain number of threads, you can also export this variable OMP num threads and you will get the same result. Okay. One point to note here is also in the previous code is num threads here is a local variable, it will be stored in the stack. It's not visible outside this scope. Okay. Yet another way to do this would be this function called OMP set num threads. Okay. And this is also going to give you the same result. Uh, now you have a number of threads. Often it's possible that you want to do something based on the thread ID. So like you have process IDs. Within a process, you also have a thread ID. Okay. So uh, this this function call will get you the OMP get thread num. This is the function call to get thread ID. And now if you do hello from thread so and so, you will get, uh, so the numbering starts from zero. So you'll get, if you are running using four threads, you will get zero, one, two, three. And these two are local variables. Uh, please try this out. Uh, whatever uh, number you specify, OMP num thread six, 10, whatever, it's going to print zero of five, one on five and so on. Yes, there was a question. Uh, Ma'am, these threads uh, will be running on the user space. Yes, this is a user application. These are not OS threads. These are this is your uh, this is a user uh, space thread. Yes. Okay. These are not kernel threads. Okay. Ma'am, why will it sprint multiple times? We are running it only once, right? We are running once, but we are launching four different threads. Okay. The thread, as soon as you say thread, this is going to, so this, uh, the execution context, there are four different execution contexts. Okay, so every of those thread is going to say hello from, uh, is going to execute this statement, print. Okay, ma'am. Hmm. So this is what will, uh, I mean, one of the outputs that you may see. Uh, any observations? So I have run this two different times. OK, I've run GCC so and so and dot slash uh, foo dot slash foo twice. Uh, what is the observation that you see from here? It's not ordered properly. Yeah, not ordered properly is one observation. And the second one? Yeah, not the same order across both of them. Correct. And why is that? Threads are scheduled randomly. Yes. Based on yes. whatever is free. Right. So the scheduling of the thread is not based on oh, thread ID 0, 1, 2, 3, nothing like that. So the OS can, uh, you know, schedule any of the threads at uh, any order. And uh, also one thing to note is you are writing it to a console, right? So which means to an IO device. So it has its own queue. So the multiple levels of randomness here. Uh, or non determinism in the okay. So uh, uh, let's look a little bit more into this variable scope. So we already uh, 
have this. We know this get num threads, it will give you the number of threads. Get thread ID, uh, get thread num, it will give the thread ID. Here in this code, I have made everyone as shared variable. Okay, so it's going into the uh, the process uh, segment, which is shared across all the um, all the threads. In this case, BSS, it's not initialized. Now inside the thread, what I'm doing, I'm doing x equal to thread ID plus one. X is also a shared variable. Um, and then I'm doing hello world, right? So let's look at the output. So I'm not sure if uh, I hope uh, all the numbers are visible. So I have ran this four different uh, four times, right? So you get uh, so that that part is clear that the sequence may not be ordered, but uh, here what I've done is I've actually sorted. Um, I've just done a sort, so I've done a dot slash foo and pipe sort. OK, so it has sorted. The thread based on the thread IDs, OK. But uh, can you uh, uh, so see what has gone wrong and why? So first of all, look at the output. And. Uh, and see, see if you can uh, analyze the reason. There is a repetition of. Threads. Yeah, there, there are several repetitions like two, two. So the first one it itself has zero one two two. The second one has one two two three, and then zero one two three four four, and then zero one three three. And of course, there's it. It's not the same pattern. And then the value of x, x which value. was thread ID plus one, right? So that may or may not repeat. So that is also repeated in some case, and that is that. In some case, it's not X plus one. It's not thread ID plus one, right? So what has happened here? Uh -huh. There's X. a mixing of context. Some threads are uh, shared variables. Huh, so there's shared variable. And uh, so let's let's take one example. Let's take the first, the very first output, right? So hello from thread ID zero and then one, two, two. Let's, so thread ID, it says zero, one, two, two. And the X value is one, two, three, five. Uh, so what could lead to this output? So we have eight threads running. OK, what is the I mean, what was the order in which those threads got scheduled and uh, which gave this output? So so zero thread ID zero has X equal to zero plus one, it's fine. Thread ID one has one plus two, it's fine. Now what happened for thread ID two? So two, two plus one is three. What happened for the next one? So there is two and then there is five. So what may have happened here? Uh, so when the thread look begins at the third and the fourth one. Yeah, pardon, sorry. What is that? Yeah, uh, when the thread beginning execution, uh, X value was not updated to three. And uh, by the time it was the printf statement came, it was updated to uh, three plus uh, five, uh, one, that's five. Uh, can you repeat that once again? Uh, at the so, beginning so of the- So we are uh, looking at, so see here, let's assume that zero, one, um, zero one five six seven are running fine okay uh let's think about thread id number two three four okay and now tell me what may have happened for for two three four two and four might have taken the data from the same cache or something because of which uh, the their thread id got mixed up while the x value got updated Thread Just ID before the got mixed up. What do you mean by thread ID got mixed up? So two um, and four. Uh, just just elaborate a little bit more. What is the exact so, execution state uh, sequence of two and four? Um, first, uh, four got, four probably ran, and then two probably ran because the thread ID of four is what got updated with two. Uh, right. Uh, Right. Whereas so X here, value is you, consistent. Right. So if you so that's one possibility, right? So four may have gotten so thread ID equal to thread get thread num when you execute the statement. Um, and let me just use a marker here. Okay. 
So this particular when you say thread ID equal to get thread num, so that's going to give return you the. Uh, so let's say that that returns you four. OK, and then immediately if you execute this X would have been updated to five. Right. Um, however, before that, it's possible that two had already executed these statements and it was just going to print this. But before it could print these, um, this value got updated actually. The X value got updated, right? So there was some interleaving of these uh, threads, right? Um, and the X got updated and that's why we are seeing some errors here, right? So this is, uh, so what is this basically called? You have studied in OS, right? Pardon? Data ah, race condition, right? So this is a critical portion of so you are accessing thread uh, shared variable. So you better be careful. So what OpenMP allows you, it it has a clause called private. If you do have to access some shared variable, then um, uh, at, but you want a private copy of it, right? Uh, and you want to do some computation based on that. So you can declare that, okay, um, I want a copy of this, right? So this this becomes a private variable in this scope. Okay, outside this, it doesn't have any meaning, but inside this, this is a private variable, thread ID and uh, X. And now if you run it, you will not get any uh, of these errors that you see in this output. Okay, all right. Uh, so moving on, uh, we will just look at. How the, did it uh, get in order this time? Uh, the thread ID. I had actually piped it to the command called sort. There's a Linux command called sort. So that's why it's printing in order. Yeah. Okay. So so that was just for so that we could look at it you know more carefully. Anyways. So let's look at one uh, example. Uh, the very simple example, uh, which is uh, sorry, uh, easy to understand, which is you have an array of numbers right? and you are trying to sum up the numbers uh, in parallel. OK, so basically you have uh, this SIMD parallelism, right? You have different data and you want to add these numbers in parallel. So every thread has some portion of the array. OK, so they are uh, you need to add different portions. Every thread will add different portions of the array. So here is a code that um, we can try to understand a little bit. So what I have done is I have used the thread ID to divide this. Basically, I'm saying that zero will look into this part, one will look into this part, and two will look into this part. And uh, very simple way to do is like you have, uh, you know, you have divided based on the total array size and the number of threads you have and so on. So very simple logic here. Now, um, so division of work is fine. And then you also need like, you need to say that I want to start from this particular location, right? Everybody's start and ending location are different. So accordingly, you say that as well. Now here is the um, thing. So you have a sum here. So sum is, a uh, private variable here, local variable here. Sorry, not private, local variable here in this thread. So every thread computes the local sum. Now, if you print this here, just before the structured block ends, you will say, you will see, you will correctly compute the partial sums from every thread. You have done that part, right? But now what you're interested in is the global sum. So how do you do that? Okay. Use it in the outside the parallel. There are multiple ways to do that. I'll just uh, tell you the most, uh, I mean, the sorry, the cleanest way, I'll just give you one hint. The cleanest way to do this would be um, to use a shared variable, which is, um, which kind of you, uh, you can update it. Um, uh, using um, using atomic statements. That is, you do not. Uh, so there is no uh, there is no uh, race condition, and uh, so there is a there is a statement called 
hash pragma uh, omp atomic okay so this is the hint and uh, we will try this out in the lab exercise okay okay so we'll talk about this again a uh, little bit more during the lab exercise so now uh, that we have you know divided the work and uh, what what is the ultimate goal we want to achieve some speed up right and how to define speed up the time that it took for one process or threads divided by the time that it took on p processes so if you have good scalability in your code in the system you know you will get speed up of p on p processes or threads right and uh, so this this linear curve is what uh, what is you expect to get all the time but in most practical cases you always fall down to sublinear that is you do not get a speed up of p probably you get a speed up of just p by 2 on p processes and uh, in this context is uh, important to remember this particular law um amdahl's law which says that uh, so speed up here so there are two parameters here which is f which says that this is the parallelizable portion of the code first of all your entire code is not parallelizable there is some portion which is which runs sequentially so in the denominator you see that there are two uh, so the left side which is 1 minus f it's the sequential portion you cannot parallelize it and then there's the parallelizable portion which is f and divided by p so f can be divided by p right and um, which which will give you that okay if um, if on one uh, so f by p will give you actually the uh, time for how much uh, how much time it will take for for uh, p processes okay <coughs> sorry and this is this is the total speed up so you can see that uh, your uh, speed up is actually limited by the sequential portion of the code even if you have very high number of processes all right so uh so this is the lab exercise that you will be doing and calculate the speed up that you get for your um for your code you should also time your code to get the speed up right so openmp has two um two ways uh, i mean oh, of course um, one way to time would be just use the time command but the other way would be to just specifically time those the parallel section if you want to um so speed up on two threads four threads and so on how much uh, speed up did you know spawning those four threads or eight threads give you so you can use this uh, function okay so moving on to distributed memory programming um uh, i have a doubt in uh, on the slides from uh, mm -hmm. the when i had the graph which kind of programs will be super linear in that case ah. so those are very few very very few so if you so one of the reasons that you may get a super linear speed up is you you were able to use the cache very well okay one of the reasons okay. that you may get uh, you know the bottleneck is is your memory like we have talked a lot about it right yes ma'am yeah so moving on to distributed memory programming uh, i want to cover this also a little bit so that you get both flavors right and we can do both in the lab exercise so here uh, just a quick recap is okay you have different processes which are running on different nodes they do not share any memory now um so so this is so mpi is the standard for this kind of programming and uh, like open mpi there is a consortium and forum and so on so this was also formed uh, almost 30 years ago and um, currently very recently version 4 was released which has many advanced features so just a quick like a uh, uh, overview of you know what is like exactly happening inside when you have distinct process uh, address space what does it mean right so you have two different processes you can initialize to you know x and y to um different values inside a process so 
very, very different from OpenMP. OK, so you have to remember that here X and Y points to two different memory address locations on two different machines. Probably it may be on the same machine, but these are the point here is these are not shared. OK, there is no race condition. There is no concurrently um, you know, accessing the same variable, same memory location. Nothing of that. These are two completely different processes, two different memory locations. OK, so if you have this kind of code and you initialize to different variables, let's say to different values to, uh, to these uh, X, Y, you will, uh, of course, uh, uh, the code that you write in MPI, so I've given you an example of two different initialization, but it doesn't mean that you write two different codes for two different MPI uh, processes. OK, the code is still the same. And so if you run this which with, with different values you have, of course you get two different outputs. Similarly, here is some other example where I have the same uh, values of the variables, but I have two different instructions. OK. I mean, these are really application specific if you. If, if your application demands to. Uh, then uh, of course you can. Uh, you can use uh, two different processes to do two different computing. Right? But uh, so like I, like I said, the process it basically consists of um, heap, data, text stack, and so on. So here we have process, right? In the MPI world, we have different processes, which means they have different stack, data, different heap. Everything is different, distinct, disjoint. In the memory, it can be, of course, laid out in any way that the OS decides to. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, these addresses, this zero cross uh, zero and zero cross F, these are virtual addresses. Yeah. Okay. So we are talking of virtual addresses only here. Yeah? Okay. So uh, now I want to first introduce a little bit about how this execution happens, right? We have looked at 96,000 nodes. I can scale the application to 96,000 nodes which have 16 cores each and so on. So huge number of cores. How does this even you know, work internally? So for that, <clears throat> if you just look at a single node, right? And uh, you have these multiple cores. Like I said, MPI can also be used for one node. You can run if you have 12 cores, um, 12 virtual cores or logical cores, you can run 12 MPI processes easily, right? And uh, so you have this uh, four different. So when you say, uh, when you tell MPI to run four processes on these four cores, and I'll show you how, four different executables or processes are going to run, right? So if you use the PS command in your system after you have told MPI that, OK, I want to launch four processes. If you use the PS command, you will see that there are these four processes running on your system. Okay. Now going to multiple nodes. Uh, of course, the same thing happens within a node. If you look so here, for example, if you say I have uh, I want to launch eight processes, two on each node. So these are four different compute nodes connected by some network, some network topology, it doesn't matter, but four different compute nodes. There are two cores each and I want to run two MPI processes on each of them. So total of eight MPI processes across this, you know, my four nodes. Each of these nodes, if you log into each of these nodes and say PS, 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 and then you will get, okay, two processes are running on every node. Okay. But how uh, basically uh, this happened will. Uh, um, so that is uh, that actually depends on the runtime. So runtime actually. Um, it it kind of spawns all the processes across all the nodes. OK, stated in simple terms. OK, so now we uh, we are talking of message passing, so which means. We are going to so the communication is via message passing. There is a network. There is a process running on some system. There's another process running on another system. Maybe two hops away, maybe 10 hops away. I don't know, but we are going to send some message. So there is some delay, right? 
when the message is being sent and when the message is being received and so on. Right? You can design your application in any way you want. You can run 10 processes and you can choose to communicate between only two pairs of them. You can communicate between all pairs of them. It's absolutely up to the programmer, right? How does this communication happen? Uh, you, you just use send receive primitives. I'll show you an example. But more than that, you don't have to worry about how to send from this node to that node. How's the routing done and so on. That's all taken care of, right? By different layers that some of it we have seen and some of it is in the MPI library. Okay. So now a real code structure, how does it look like? So we have a really simple code. Again, our hello world program. Here I have two, two uh, new lines, right? The rest of it you know. So one I have header mpi.h, but the two lines that I have are initialization and finalize. That's it. So because you are using the library for a lot of things, communication, you need to initialize for a number of things to be set up, uh, prepare for communication and so on. And this code, when you run, when you tell the system that I want to run on 10 processes, it's going to uh, spawn 10 different processes, which means 10 different, um, you know, um, printfs are going to be printed to your screen. Okay. Uh, so similar to like you want to know Perhaps that what is my uh, thread ID in case of OpenMP? Uh, you may also want to know what is my rank, what is the total number of processes. Right. So here, uh, mostly all the MPI functions. Um, so these are all library functions, and all the MPI functions they start with MPI underscore. So here, uh, apart from MPI init and finalize that we saw, we have just three different, uh, three more calls. The one is uh, com size, so it gives you total number of processes. Com rank gives you the identification. Okay, simple. So here, one thing you will notice, we are using this word called com, and there is the first parameter called MPI com world. I'll talk about it. In a minute. The rest of it is mostly same. So you can ignore get processor name. It just gives you the identification of the physical host it's running on. But other than that, uh, the rest of the uh, execution context is same. So you have, let's say, four MPI processes. So there will be four print devs, and everyone will print its own rank. So zero, one, two, three. Okay. Now about the communicator. So you have this communicator called MPI com world, which is a global communicator. So it's so you can think of like you know you have two different sections in a classroom, and so. Uh, so if you want to talk to one section, you have like a so in, 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 in that case, the communicator is just your classroom. You know, uh, the students belonging to one section are sitting in one classroom. So if you have to talk among uh, something which is specific to that section, you talk inside that classroom. So you need kind of a communicator if you want to talk among all these processes. OK, so every uh, MPI function, you will need to specify which communicator you Require and if you want to talk to everyone, then you will use the global communicator, which is the MPI COM world. Okay, so um, it base so just to recap, uh, so communicator basically defines the scope, and the process is identified by a rank, and these are two simple functions for the identification. Okay, uh, one quick thing is um, this global communicator, um, you may also uh, think uh, you may also require certain applications that it talks only to a subsection. Every process just needs to talk to a subset, right? It doesn't need to talk to everybody. Okay? So in that case, you can actually divide this communicator and so on. So those are called sub communicators. Anyways, we won't go into details. Now, how to compile your code? Very simple. If you have installed um, um, MP, uh, MPI CH, which is uh, there's there's also open MPI, there's MPI CH. So um, MPI CH is more widely used. It's an open source MPI library. Uh, if you haven't, just do sudo apt-get install MPI CH. That's it. 
be sure that you have done this before the lab session. Then you compile using the uh, MPI command. It basically links all the MPI libraries and so on. And then you execute using another MPI command. Okay, so I'll upload the slides. You will have these and you can test this out. So if you want to run on one process, you can say minus NP1. I want to run on one process. You want to run on six processes, you can say minus NP6. It will launch six processes. If you do not specify any host file, machine file, node file, that is you do not specify where you want to run, it will de by default, it will just run on your system. If you do have an access to a lab, right? Uh, and your lab is actually connected, um, your institute lab is all connected, and you are able to install MPI in your cluster, you can try using a host file and you can give the IP addresses in the host file of those nodes and you can run whatever, the same way you can run one, two, three, four, whatever number of processes you want, the same program will run on all these hosts, whatever you specify in the host file. Okay. Okay, and uh, uh, so here, uh, like uh, just a quick recap is when you said uh, host file, you specify a certain number of cores and nodes in the host file. And remember, we also got a process ID. So by default, it will just go according to the nodes that is specified. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. These are the pr process IDs that will be launched on these nodes. Um, how this is done? We um, so we basically uh, so let's look at this diagram. So we basically the runtime uses uh, proxy executable, which basically uh, launches all these processes. Whatever you have specified, it will launch that many processes on the other nodes. Whatever you have specified in your host file, and uh, it kind of maintains a uh, you know. Um, key value store and so on. So it has a database of all the information about what are the ranks on that process, on that node, what are the ranks on the other nodes and so on. So when you say that, okay, send the message to this process ID, you don't need to worry about anything. The runtime basically takes care of. It has all the information. Okay, this process ID is present on that node and so on. Okay. All right. So a little bit about the programming uh, communication basically. Um, so there are two different kinds of communication you can do. You can talk one on one, point to point. You can talk to everyone, broadcast, right? You like right now I'm uh, talking to everyone or I can divide you into groups and I can talk to a subset of you one at a time, right? Or you can divide among uh, yourselves and uh, you can create smaller groups and so on. So or everyone can talk to everybody, right? Of course, um, now we can't do that. But uh, in MPI world, you can really uh, create any kind of communication pattern you want um, uh, using certain functions. So I'll just look at uh, two functions, two simple functions. We don't have time to go into much depth, but these are the two very basic functions, right? Uh, send and receive. So like I said, MPI functions start with MPI underscore. So MPI underscore send and MPI underscore receive. The sender process will call this function MPI send and the receiver process will call MPI receive. So how does that work? How will sender process know that, you know, uh, I have to call this and I remember I said that there's just one code. There are, there are not two, three different codes that we are writing. So uh, before that, let's look at the arguments. So we have a few important arguments. The first argument is the data. The sender says I want to send this data. And the second argument says I want to send these many elements from this data. Okay. One of the arguments uh, here is tag. There can be multiple sends and receives going on. So you need a tag so that the library knows that, okay, this send has to be matched to this receive and so on. And the other point here is this is a blocking send. So if you say send, you will be blocked till the other process receives it. Um, so what do you send? You send data, which is basically basically an MPI message, and it has the identity of uh, you know, uh, the origin of the message, or who is the receiver, and 
what communicator are you using and there's a tag. Okay. There's also the third parameter that we were using, which is MPI data type. Uh, for certain reason, MPI um, uses its own data type for you know compatibility across all systems and so on. So they use MPI underscore byte int and so on for uh, for the data type. And then there is a function called MPI status, which you can use to uh, query what exactly you received, how much you received, um, uh, who sent you and so on. Sometimes this is useful. Anyway, so let's look at the function. I told you that there will be just one code. But in this one code, you have to ensure that there is a sender who is you know, the sender is sending and the receiver is receiving. So in this code, I have assumed that the sender is rank zero and the receiver is rank one. Very simple case, right? So here I will say uh, the if I just use if to say that, okay, if my identification, I'm the rank zero, then please execute this statement. This will not be executed by the rank one. Okay, the process one uh, will execute the receive statement. Okay. Now, uh, of course, we do not want to, uh, we don't always use, uh, you know, uh, if rank equals zero and so on. We rather use uh, much more generic expressions. So, for example, if you want to send data from half of the processes have done some computing and you want to send the data for to the other half of the processes, you will just use some expression like, okay, if rank less than n by two or something like that. So the point being that uh, you don't write code which is specific to either number of ranks or the rank ID or so on. So that becomes difficult to maintain, it's error pro and so on. So try to write code which is um, much more generic and, and that's the challenging part of parallel programming. Okay. Uh, point here to notice the message tag should be same. Okay. Uh, just uh, one or two slides on uh, collective communication where I am not talking one on one, but I am talking to a group of processes. Okay, there are different kinds of collective communication, and one of them is the reduce function, which um, if you can use in the lab exercise, that will be good. So reduce function, what it does is it uh, combines elements of an array according to the operation that you specify. If you say that you add all the elements of the array, it will add. So this op argument here, the fifth argument op, this is basically the operation. Hmm. So if you say sum up all the elements of all these arrays, it will sum up. So all these arrays are what? These are local arrays in all the processes. And uh, the local arrays is being summed up. So it has to be stored somewhere, right? So you can specify any process as the root process and you can say, this is my root process and this is going to store the sum or max or min, whatever of all the arrays that represent all the other processes. Okay. All right, so uh, just uh, to summarize, uh, like you, um, so we have just, you know, um, mostly we do not use this um, server master kind of programming paradigm that becomes less scalable if you uh, use that. So we use uh, mostly uh, these kinds of uh, MPI codes are um, SIMD. They follow the SIMD paradigm. And uh, for example, the uh, Excel that you are going to do, um, you are going to sum up an array. Right? So I'm going to just uh, say a little bit about it. So here, uh, very similar to what I said in the open MP, right? So you are summing up uh, from say one to N. So when you have P processes, you will sum from, you will only sum up N by P, right? So every thread, every process is going to work on just N by P chunk of that data. And so your <coughs> start and end index, these are different. Every process, they will calculate a local sum and then you have to calculate the global sum. Now, um, we have learned send receive. Every process can send its local sum to one process. We can designate that every process uh, can send its local sum to process zero, right? Or we can use this collective that we just heard, reduce, okay? 
then you don't need to say send receive. You just need to write reduce. That's just one line of code. So that is what you're going to do in the exercise. Um, it starts at 2.30. So you can use, uh, you can, you may not use reduce, you may use reduce and your, uh, um, you can use your laptop, you, whatever number of codes you have, you can calculate the speed up, up to that number of uh, processes. <sighs> and uh, here too we have MPI W time. You can time the code, which is your, you know, just the compute part of the code. Um, compute and communication, of course, not only the compute, the so compute plus communication. Communication plays an important role, uh, as you can understand in parallel programming world when you are talking of, you know, 100,000 nodes and processes. So that's important to time. And uh, finally, if you have not installed, please go ahead and install in this one and a half hour you have. It won't take much time. Uh, and I leave you this one thought. So uh, often uh, many uh, <coughs> papers are there which says, OK, we have to. So we definitely have to reduce the communication time because communication is an artifact of the fact that we are running on multiple nodes which are connected by network and they don't share memory. So we have to communicate and so on. But it so there's a very nice line that I read in this paper recently. So it says communication is an investment. It's some people consider it as an overhead, but it's actually an investment if you have to scale your code or if you have to run your code, right? You are expecting some speed up of running your code on 100,000 cores. So it's an investment. Okay. So there's a there's a whole lot of things that. Uh, I mean that we can talk about communication, but um, this is just a very, very, very brief overview of uh, OpenMPI and uh, MPI. Uh, so do do please do the lab exercises uh, in the afternoon, and we'll talk about uh, that later again. Okay. So any questions? I'm in slide forty-four. Forty-four. Sorry. Uh, there, this process zero has to run on two cores. So using open LTE. No, 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 no. You, uh, don't. Uh, so, okay, there, are, there are two cores there. Uh, it's just a schematic. Uh, I mean, one process will run on one core. I. This is not multi-threaded or anything. So, uh, you can assume one process is running on one core. If you want to run, then you have to use open LTE there. Uh, yeah, you can use, you can use within one process. You can use multi-threading. Yes, and that's done. But it's not always the case that if you have, let's say, so like we we saw, we have seventy core machines and so on. I mean, seventy core in one node and so on. But it's not always the case that you will get speed up just using OpenMP. Remember, we have um, we have a lot to worry about, a uh, lot of things to worry when we use shared memory programming. So it often uh, is possible that you may um, there is a um, there there is kind of a uh, balance between how many you know um, number of processes and number of threads within a process that you use within a node itself. So that can that can significantly affect your application runtime. Uh, but uh, when you say some kind of cluster uh, and there are more. Pardon, I'm not able to hear you very clearly. Can you come closer to the mic, maybe? Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I, I was asking that uh, when we say there are clusters and there are nodes, then each node has uh, one operating system and, uh, and the. Yes. Yes. Program. So here, for example, if you have four nodes, there are these are completely different, uh, you know, OSs. I mean, different as in, of course, the same flavor, same everything. But you have to install the OS. Uh, just like you install on your laptop, yes. Um, then when how how does it compile on each machine like this? The source code. It doesn't compile. It doesn't compile on each machine actually. So I I didn't have much time to go into much depth, but I had a slide where I mentioned something about a launch node. Of course, things are a little bit different in supercomputers, but if you just let's say yeah, so there is actually a launch node where we are compiling. Okay, it can be any one of these nodes. 
in supercomputers you actually have a login node if you remember if you look at the diagram that i showed in the param sanganak uh, the overview there are actually login nodes those are not compute nodes that's where you compile okay there is a different software that's going to launch your process so in this case there is just a process manager which is built inside the mpi runtime it launches the processes on the other nodes okay in the supercomputer also uh, you can look up uh, this uh, scheduler called slurm so slurm takes care of uh, you know launching your job onto the compute nodes so it is not compiled on every node you don't need to you just need the executable what is compilation you don't need to compile on every node you need to run on every node right was that clear uh, yes ma'am as in that uh, the load that login load has the same operating system and the same setup compiler as that of the yes so you uh, so yes the hardware the uh, so yes so it's it's a uh, that is one assumption that you may have to make about the hardware not necessarily the os but hardware yes and generally supercomputers like um, like i showed so there are 200 nodes so these are exactly identical nodes okay Any other question? Then can we specify number of processes to run at runtime? Yeah, that's what we did. So here, um, I mean, in this slide itself, I think. So minus NP eight. That is what we are saying. That launch eight processes. I mean, uh, in the program itself. In the program. To, yeah. No, no. So in the program itself, we cannot because. Everything happens before the program even starts execution. Many things happen, not everything. Many things happen, which is the communication. I mean, where the nodes are spawned and everything, where the processes are spawned and which nodes. And so a little bit of the setup is actually done before you before you call MPI in it. OK, but but, in but the thread case, I think no, but, right. So thread is slightly different. But what you can do is, let's say you have an application where I, I'm just saying it's it's not usually the case. Okay, sorry. Uh, so, um, uh, sorry for the interruption. Can you remind me what was your question? At runtime, the number of processes. Right. So, scale. so, um, so if you want, if your application is such that you want a different number of processes and different parts of the application. Like I said, you can use sub communicator, right? Of course, uh, you can use you can launch on you can launch ten processes and you can use uh, send receive just among any two processes. All that is fine, uh, but the but the launching takes place much before actually you start your code. That, that's the point. Okay. okay. Any other question or we can uh, stop here and we can resume at 2.30.
Ma'am, in the host file, uh, is it necessary to? I mean, do we have to specify all the nodes which are in the cluster for the computing? Not all the nodes in the cluster. The all the nodes that you are interested in using. Okay. okay. So your cluster can have fifty nodes, but you may just use five nodes. But you need to specify five nodes. You can even specify six, seven nodes. That's fine. So it'll take the top five nodes and it'll run on that. Okay. Okay. So let's uh, let's resume back at two thirty and we'll do the lab exercise then. Please install and PICH by then. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Fine. So we will resume back at two thirty.